the world's young came this way. Aspirations came with them. There was huge enthusiasm for this great adventure. Our young had gone to the world and their dreams went with them. pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the Council of Monash University to this, the 1,129th graduation ceremony of Monash University. Each day when I walk to my office, I pass through streams of young people brimming with potential. Their energy, their desire to learn, their ambition to make their mark upon the world are palpable. We're here today to remember five men who were tragically denied those opportunities. Three of them were no older than the students who this morning caught the number 19 tram. On the wall, on the upper tier of this theatre, sits the Pharmacy Roll of Honour. It lists the names of nearly 200 Victorian pharmacists, including approximately 30 Victorian pharmacy students who served in World War I. Today, we confer posthumous Bachelors of Pharmacy with honours upon four students, Alan Couve, Eric Bissett, Gordon Jukes and Malcolm Jones. Each of them enrolled at the Melbourne College of Pharmacy. Each served in the infantry. Each burned brightly with promise and had that promise extinguished in that war. In death, they will receive the contemporary equivalent of the qualification that was stolen from them in life. We also honour a fifth student, Frank Carr. Frank served in the medical corps. Unlike his four fellow students, he returned to Australia from the war, but not unscathed. In recognition of his service and of the terrible toll it exacted soon after, we will today confer upon him a certificate of recognition and appreciation. On Anzac Day, the ode concludes at the going down of the sun and in the morning we will remember them. And we respond, we will remember them. But who are them? Monash University took its first students in 1961. Sir John Monash, after whom the university is named, had died 30 years earlier. Today's Faculty of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences was originally the Melbourne College of Pharmacy that was established in 1881 by the Pharmaceutical Society of Victoria. It is the only part of today's university that existed when Sir John was alive and is therefore the only part of the university that had students and alumni who served under him during World War I. Sir John's wartime achievements were instrumental in bringing World War I to a conclusion in 1918. As the centenary of the armistice approached, we wanted to better understand the role of the college our students and our links to Sir John Monash. Visible connections to World War I are a feature of our campus. The War Memorial Building, the Honour Board in Cossa Hall and this memorial book containing the names of students and pharmacists who served during wartime. Every name on this Honour Board represents the story of an individual. And these stories are mostly untold or have faded from memory. Delving into these stories, we never imagined the connections we would find or that the messages from 100 years ago would be relevant and vibrant today. We discovered important family stories of the five student soldiers and we humbly recognise their contributions and sacrifice on behalf of Australia in World War I. During this project, we've worked with, learnt from and engaged so many wonderful people. And indeed, this remembrance project has been one of the highlights of my time as Dean. Please join with me as we take this journey of discovery together. So the 
process of going through and identifying these uh, soldiers is involved getting down into the basements like this where there's just, you know, an amazing array of history and working through the things that you might find. We're also overjoyed to have here with us so many of the family members of those five soldiers. Through this process, I know that the faculty has reached out and feels that you are now part of their family. And as part of our commemorative project, the faculty commissioned botanical artist Christine Johnson, who is with us here today, to represent each of the five student soldiers. Her evocative and bespoke artwork is displayed here on the stage. Each of those pieces of art are a gift from the university to each of the families of the student soldiers. There is something really transformative about making art. It shifts, it shifts the consciousness and it distills information into something new. A picture can simply be that, just a thing on canvas or a drawing on paper. But there's this really mysterious thing, and this is what absolutely drives me, just allowing an opportunity to occur where this other dimension comes into the work so that it communicates feeling. Today we add a postscript to the stories of those past students because, as with all graduates, they are joined forever in their connection to this institution. Ellen Crawford Coove. Ellen was from a pharmacy family. He was apprenticed to his father, Yosin, who was the proprietor of the Coove Pharmacy, situated in the thriving main street of Daninong. Ellen enlisted in 1914 and as a first lieutenant in the 8th Battalion, he led his men into battle on the beaches at Gallipoli on the morning of the 25th of April, 1915, the day that forevermore would become known as Anzac Day. He was the first Melbourne College of Pharmacy student to be killed in World War I. When I first saw Alan's photo, I can see recognition of my brother in that. I can see the eyes are the same. This larrikinism about them, you can see it in the facial expression he's wearing. They were so young. They were just boys. It was months before the scale of the Gallipoli tragedy was understood. It was years before the slaughter on the Western Front and beyond ceased. Many Victorians enlisted immediately, understanding that they would be home by Christmas. Eric Simpson Bissett. Eric enlisted in 1915, and after periods of training in Egypt, England, and Northern France, Private Bissett fought in the 1916 Somme Offensive. On the morning of the 14th of November, Eric and his fellow soldiers were waiting for their breakfast rations when their trench was struck by an artillery shell. Eric and at least eight others were instantly killed. My great-uncle Eric was killed in 1916 and my father was born in 1917 and he's named after him. He is John Eric. He was John Eric. In my research it said he was a chemist but it didn't say that he was a student so I, I didn't know the, the connection here until I was contacted. There were only two lots of visits in Australia for Andrew to try and find. <laughs> so he had a bit of a struggle. We'd done a few trips to France to visit my grandparents when they were spending a lot of time there and visited the cemeteries and you learnt little bits here and there and visiting different war sites or memorials and going to memorials ourselves here on Anzac Day. You know a bit about the war but it becomes more personal when you know those details. Where he was killed was somewhere in that vicinity there. My first feeling was pride that they were doing it and gratitude because I thought so often history just gets forgotten and the sad thing about that war was no matter who went, very few people wanted to talk about it. So a whole generation of personal memories were never recorded. In that speculation, there is a powerful thing that happens that's to do with your own imaginative, empathetic feeling for each of these people. From an artistic point of view, that's given me a task, a task that I have tried to honour in the best way I can. Wallace Gordon Jukes. Lieutenant Jukes of the 39th Battalion led his men on a raid on the night of the 10th of January 1917. Gordon was shot in the head from a concealed position as he entered the enemy dugout and died hours later. 
I've always been interested in family history, but never had time to pursue it terribly much. Andrew was able to mine a little deeper. In particular, I think the letter from my great uncle to his mother the night before he was killed was particularly moving. It was written at the front, this pencil letter, and sent to his parents with a photograph of himself. The most beautiful line is at the end, and it's, dear mother and father, do not sorrow for me. Huge mixture of emotions, pride, of course, uh, in the family, um, sorrow at the thought of, number one, the countless waste of lives in that war, and number two, what my Uncle Gordon might have, might have done had he returned home and what the family might have been like. Um, slight sense of unworthiness, standing up there receiving this honour on behalf of a long dead relative. Working in a university, we're blessed. We're so fortunate because every year there are new young people come into our lecture theatres, our laboratories. And if we think back to the students who were at the college who then chose to go to war, those that did not come back, they yeah. were young men yeah. with all of the potential that the students have that come into our program today. 6,000 Australians in Belgium and 11,000 in France with no known graves. And you look at them and it just goes on and on and on and you think that potential that was there, that talent that was there, you know. Gordon's elder brother, Gilbert, was a Gallipoli veteran. Gilbert survived the war, returned to this college to complete his studies in pharmacy. During his career, Gilbert was awarded an OBE for his founding work as a director of what we know today as the Pharmaceutical Benefits Scheme. Malcolm Jones. Malcolm and his elder brother, Alan Murray, were both apprenticed to their father, John Albert Jones, who was a pharmacist in Caulfield. Malcolm enlisted in 1915, and after training in England and northern France, he fought in France and Belgium with the 24th Battalion. Sergeant Jones was killed by an artillery shell attack near Ypres in Belgium on the 4th of October, 1917. Malcolm's brother Murray, who would later become the commander of the second squadron of the Australian Flying Corps, returned to complete his studies here at the College of Pharmacy in 1920. The existence of Malcolm, and indeed the existence of the other children of my great-grandfather came as a surprise. And I think it came as a surprise to all of my family. I don't think anybody, anybody knew about it. And we put it down to it being of the time of being a very unpleasant time in, in many ways. Uh, and that, that this whole episode was, was, was blanked and not, and not brought into the family. But, but greatly, greatly surprised to, to find out about it and delighted that the university took the efforts to tell us. He's just sort of this classic unknown soldier, this unknown family member. And that's probably been the kind of quite emotional thing for me, that there could be this family member who died at the age of 20, and I have a 20-year-old son, so it certain, had a certain poignancy possibly because of that. You do have this feeling that you're reconnecting with, the, you know, a living history. Very sweet to have all this family background presented to us. As, as we feel very privileged. But yeah, one does sit and wonder what what would have happened if the Malcolm was about, and and more family and more cousins, um, and yeah, how it is. It's given me a real sense of belonging um, in this story of civilization, of this history that we've. Created. It's, it's like I can say that's where my lineage came from. It's, I've got a connection that I never really had before and I found that really, really beautiful thing. Thomas Francis Carr. Frank Carr enlisted in 1914 and was a staff sergeant in the second field ambulance. He landed on the beaches of Gallipoli on the 25th of April 1915. And over the next seven days, he continuously rescued and carried wounded men single-handedly from exposed positions while under exceptionally heavy machine gun and artillery fire. To receive a certificate of recognition and appreciation for Frank Carr's service and for the Carr family's support of our project, I present to you Frank's 93-year-old son, Mr Patrick Carr. I think you'd be rather amazed that his alma mater <laughs> was yes. honouring him this way. I think he would be shocked, don't you? Yeah, without a doubt. In many ways, the early pharmacists of World War I in the field ambulance paved the way for the modern-day profession of paramedicine. 
Soldiers in the Royal Australian Army Medical Corps, like Staff Sergeant Frank Carr, often would see the immediate and most bloody impact of war. Sunday, April the 25th, is a day I will never forget. The beach was strewn with wounded and dying Australians and Turks. Three of our own fellows were hit before we went a dozen yards. You should have seen the wounded. It is impossible to describe it. Those first few days are like a huge nightmare to us. Not only did he survive all of that, but at the end of the war, after the armistice, Frank went back to the battlefields to photograph the remains of fallen soldiers whose bodies were being exhumed and identified. I think that just took incredible courage. So for Frank Carr, I chose the hibiscus diversifolia. It's a native hibiscus. It really thrives in swampy ground. And I thought, oh, that's sort of interesting. It reminded me of the lotus, the Eastern symbol of enlightenment. And there's something about that image that I thought was appropriate for him. And it has pale yellow petals and a deep crimson center. And to me, that represented the the passion and dedication behind him and the work that he did, what a good, good man he was. Like many returned soldiers, Frank battled in silence with the challenges of post-traumatic stress and the difficulties of returning to normal life. The toll of his wartime experiences and the battles of re-assimilation became too much, and in 1928, Frank became yet another casualty of the war. I used to think a lot of the father that I didn't know. I guess there's a bit of a void in our lives, but once again, my mother was the uh, one, the rock, really, for all our young lives. We had a happy childhood. She never discussed it at all. There was the mentality of coming home from war and not talking about these things, was to get back to work quickly and shut it all up and don't refer to any of the horrors and don't pass them on to your children or your families. And, and so I'm sure my family is very much like that. Um, my grandfather, who did come home, never spoke of Gordon that I remember. And I think that was so for a lot of people. And, and of course, people coped and, uh, or didn't cope in varying degrees of success. As a result of all that's happening now, I feel the, the father that I never met is still involved with what we're saying and doing. Very comforting feeling. Pat, would you like to place the poppy next to your father's name? Could I say a little prayer? Please do. Yes. yes. Uh, father, son, the Holy Spirit, amen. God bless you, my father. My father, son, the Holy Spirit, amen. We're here now in Albany and we're driving down this street that soldiers would have marched down before they've forded boats and so on to go across to World War I. So the five soldiers, as yes. we call them, plus John Monash, went out through there. We don't know what they were thinking, but I guess they had a sense of adventure in some way, or were anticipating Even some adventure. celebration and excitement. And yet it's quite solemn for us because we know what happened to them. All those famous photos that we see of 30-odd boats, I think there's 28 Australian ships, 10 New Zealand ships, they're all out there just aggregating, getting ready to head off. As the boats have gone out through here and those soldiers look back towards where we're standing now, that would have been their last view of the Australian mainland. And their next stop was conflict in Europe. Listening for the silent sounds. When the 
You know, the memory of the First World War, I don't know what it means for, for young people, you know, but for, for a century, in, at least in my lifetime, it's been, it's been a sort of byword for slaughter, for waste, for trauma, for futility. Uh, over time, those, those meanings will, you know, they'll be, become diluted. They, they won't have the, the living presence. John Monash often wrote about the horrors of war and the terrible price that was being paid by so many soldiers, many Australians, and he was really driving with heartfelt passion to try and look after them and protect them. He says quite plainly that he hated the whole concept of war. He valued people. Yes. He refused to think of his troops as cannon fodder. Mm. He said, no, I have to get them in the best shape, mm. physical, mental, as I can, with the limited resources that I can. Um, other generals didn't think that way. There's one more important connection, and that's the connection of this particular faculty with the university's eponym, Sir John Monash. In 1927, he delivered the inaugural address to open the academic year. His comments are timeless and completely relevant today. The plaque on the wall here quotes him as saying, every student should become an observer. Any one, one of them bringing, bringing a lively intellect, intellect to bear come. upon his or her daily work might come upon a phenomenon which were strange and new and maybe stepping stones to further discoveries for the use of civilization. That's magic. Mm. That's more than just the name of a university. It's the spirit of the person that the university was named after. And he was also the president of the Australian Association for the Advancement of Science, the equivalent of today's chief scientist. What that man could do was amazing. We are now, of course, part of Monash University, and I think it's fascinating that he was able to give a speech at what became an important part of the university long before Monash University, of course, came into existence. Freedom is precious, particularly when one considers how easily it is lost to despots and dictatorships in the world today. It's extraordinary the um, uh, power that Monash might have wielded in the 1920s. A um, best example is when fascism was on the rise around the world, the great concern about the Great Depression and poverty and so on. And there was a, a number of movements in Australia, um, very fascist, who were trying to, to um, get the government overthrown. And they approached Monash um, with the intent of him being the great leader to take the country forward. These dictatorships were all built around the idea of the great man, and the great man in Australia at that time was Sir John. But he wrote back to these plotters and said, um, I will have none of your plans. There is only one hope for Australia, and that is the ballot box and a good education. It shows his, um, I think, great commitment to what, for a better term, is Australian values of equality and democracy, um, which were in fairly short supply at that time uh, around the world. Understanding who we are as Australians can be a challenge. What we need to do is learn from those great figures of our past, learn about what they achieved, their successes and failures, learn from their values, how they encapsulated what they did in a way that can help us today and plan a greater future for our country. Not long ago, a year nine student asked me, why should we bother? It was so long ago. And it was an honest question. The message is simple. Mere storytelling and ritual isn't enough. We have to find contemporary connections to those who served, the people, places and events involved and their significance. 
If we are to pass the torch to future generations, we have to ensure those generations can pick up these threads of connection for themselves, give them the tools to do so, and ensure they own and understand those threads. I think John Monash would be impressed at the effort made today in remembrance of those soldiers. Sacrifice becomes real when the people have names and are remembered. Picture the five boys we honour today. Imagine a blood red thread drawn from the poppies outside. Roll it out across the world to where they lie now and to all the places they served and visited, to their homes, to their gardens, their schools and churches, their sporting clubs, the streets they walked, the beaches where they swam, the pharmacies where they worked, the homes of their loved ones, their friends, and to this college and to you. You'd have to be made of stone to not shed a tear from time to time around what these young men went through. Just a remarkable story, a, a lot of remarkable stories. I couldn't have imagined the power of today. I really couldn't have. All this time I've been contemplating and doing the artworks and sensing into the lives that we know really so very little about, but have come to know each of these soldiers in what feels like a personal way. But today it's all been brought together through meeting the families, and that's been really powerful, meeting Pat Carr, Frank Carr's son. He, in a way, represents our connection with the story of all the soldiers, and it's been very moving. They shall grow not old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them. Who are them? Them are us. We are all connected. Connection is for every going down of the sun and every morning. Lest we forget, we must connect. Oh, 
A song for those waiting.